Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Hamsa Srikant and I'm one of the two Athenaeum fellows this year. When I was about seven years old, I became obsessed with Pompeii, the ancient Roman city. I even wrote a short story about it, featuring a first grader named Julia, who single-handedly saved the people of Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted and buried the entire city in a thick carpet of volcanic ash. Fifteen years later, I actually visited the ruins of Pompeii for the first time. I discovered that there's now an entire digital infrastructure project dedicated to telescoping the city down to each wall, each mosaic, each object, and each motif within those artworks. I also discovered, much to my dismay, that my short story was filled with historical inaccuracies. <laughs> we know so much more about Pompeii today than we did 15 years ago. In our talk tonight, Eric Paylor will discuss how digital technologies have revolutionized the way that archaeologists study and understand the past. Eric Paylor is an associate professor of classics at UMass Amherst as an, astro um, <laughs> as an archaeologist. Uh, Paylor specializes in the architecture, infrastructure, and urbanism of the Roman world. Currently, he is also the director of the Blended Learning and Digital Humanities program for the five colleges incorporated. His major digital project, the Pompeii Bibliography and Mapping Project, was awarded Outstanding Work in Digital Archaeology in 2018 by the Archaeological Institute of America. This platform has now expand, expanded to support the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project, which seeks to document all of Pompeii's wall paintings and mosaics in their architectural settings. Paylor has more than 20 years of experience in this field, so we are understandably very excited to have him speak tonight. Professor Paylor's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Digital Humanities Initiative at the Claremont Colleges. This will be a 45-minute presentation, and there will be a Q&A at the end. As always, I must remind you that audiovisual recording is strictly prohibited at the Athenaeum. Please use this opportunity to put away your devices, stuff your face with some mousse, and adjust your seat if you've not already done so. And without further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Paylor. Thank you, Hansa. Thank you. Well, let me start just by saying, my gosh, my voice is loud. Um, let me start by saying thank you to you all for coming. Thank you to the Athenaeum for inviting me. Thank you particularly to Dr. Lee Lieberman for uh, being a friend and colleague and facilitating this. Um, let me start with this image. I like to start my talks with a bit of a provocation. And what you're seeing here is the wonderful archaeological site of Pompeii veering up the Via Stabiana to smoke rising off of Mount Vesuvius. And in this case, it's one of the few opportunities, and I shouldn't even call it an opportunity, it's one of the few occasions in which in 20 years in the ancient city, I had something of the feeling of what it was like to look up and see the mountain raging above the city, right? In all the time that we spend in Pompeii, we're interested in dis discovering and uncovering the past. And we often become a bit scientific about it, a little too scientific about it. And sometimes it's hard to feel that way that other people felt. And you actually don't really want to feel the way that the people felt on that horrible day uh, in AD 79. But this gives us something of that image. And on a day when just after Notre Dame burned down, um, I realized the importance of digital technologies all the more. Because one of the immediate responses from people who work in the field like I, uh, <coughs> I work in was to show off what we still had of it, what was missing, but what was also preserved. And it's very interesting because there was also a response from other folks that said, the digital isn't enough. There's more that we've lost. We've lost something in it. And I'm sympathetic to both of those statements. What I would say is that I'm glad still that we have something of the laser scans, the 3D models, the photographs, the videos, the digital documentation of Mont Notre Dame because it gives us something right now to hold on to as we live through this kind of challenge. And if we look at Pompeii and we look at what is only a forest fire on the side of Mount, uh, on, on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius, we are reminded that although 
we have Pompeii now, someday we won't. And all that we will have is what we will have written down and recorded. So digital technologies are a way for us to preserve something for the future. Let's see, this is, if I, if I am walking weird, it's because I'm wearing this thing for the first time and I feel a little bit like, a little bit, my neck is a little stiff. So let's see if I can get this to go the right way. There we go. I want to introduce to you uh, three sites. I want to talk to you about three different technologies and I want to use, I want to give you the idea of the ancient city as a digital scaffold. So I want to take us to Greece, to a site called Isthmia, where I believe the ancient architecture is a kind of instrument. It's a way for us to understand itself. I want to take us to a new place that we're beginning with, with, with Lee, in a place called Tharos, in which the ancient city and its architecture is a form of infrastructure. And then I want to take us to, uh, back to Pompeii, where we've started this talk, with a occasion of a new technology um, that uses the city as a network. So, these also are arranged in terms of time, where at Ismia we'll be looking at geographical information systems, something that is actually quite robust in terms of a technology today. We'll be looking at Tharos, at drones, something that has been around, some things that have been around for a while but are now becoming uh, a bit more emergent and much easier to use and what we can do with them. I'll show off a little bit of that. And then uh, linked open data is what we'll be talking about for Pompeii and how we use this format to create a new way of looking at information and sharing it in particular. Okay, so let's start out with Ismia. Uh, that's how you spell it. <laughs> Ismia is a, a famous archaeological site uh, in the classical world uh, here, unsurprisingly, uh, in Greece on the isthmus that connects the uh, mainland of Greece to the Peloponnesus. It's famous in particular because it was a Panhellenic sanctuary site. Now, you guys all know the Olympics are held every four years, right? except for the Winter Olympics, right? They're, they're, they, they interrupt that every two years. But the reason why the Olympics are held every four years is because there were three other great sanctuary sites in the ancient world that held games. And one of them was this site called Ismia. So Ismia, like Olympia, was a famous site that uh, was venerated and visited over for a, a great amount of time. It actually kind of was split up over time, two time periods. It, it, was, um, uh, it was a site that flourished in the archaic period of Greece from the 7th century all the way down into the 1st 2nd century BCE. The Romans kind of screwed things up for a little while, but then they brought it back. Uh, and in the 2nd century CE, um, we have this guy called Pausanias who visits the site and describes in a kind of ancient travelogue what he saw while he was there. And what he saw, as you see here, is, <coughs> excuse me, is the following. He says, as you go into the sanctuary, presumably from the stadium here, uh, meaning um, this, sta this little stadium here, this is the buried archaic stadium, this is the sanctuary. As you go into the sanctuary, there are portrait statues of athletes who won at the Isthmian Games and some pine trees in a line, mostly growing straight up. Now, in, 19, in the 1950s, a guy by the name of Oscar Bernier, who naturally became a famous uh, classical archaeologist, discovered the Temple of Poseidon, and his graduate student wanted nothing less than the same level of fame. And reading his Pausanias, he discovers, of course, that if I dig wherever this road is, I will find these victorious athletes. I will find a great cache of statues. And so what does his graduate student by the name of Paul Clement do? He says, well, if this seems to be the entrance to the to, uh, near the st entrance near the stadium to the temenos, to the temple area, then this area should be somewhere, somewhere in this area should be where we would find these statues. So from 1970 to 1972, he puts in these long trenches prospecting across the site, fills in this space in between, but never finds the road, never finds the statues. Finds instead a landscape filled with what they thought were quite unimpressive classical ruins. These are late Roman buildings. You can see some of the big blocks that were from the archaic stadion here reused in the site. But instead you see a very scrappy, unimpressive landscape. And you see a, a, a much younger me uh, 
uh, tr- sitting amongst the ruins, trying desperately to figure out what it all meant. Now, when we arrived, we had training in classical architecture and particularly in studying Roman architecture. We'd been trained in Pompeii and had a system of how we might do this work, but we quickly realized that this was not going to work out because, for one, the digital work, the digital work that had been done that was quite good didn't give us a good starting point because as much as you can see how in the world are you supposed to figure that out, the AutoCAD plan we got wasn't much better. We couldn't tell what were rooms that belonged together as part of a building and what were places of two different buildings that overlapped each other and became a false room. They were never meant to go together. Not only could we not find a room, we had trouble finding any doorways and we couldn't tell what was inside of a putative building or outside. We were completely confounded as we approached this site and so we needed, we realized what we needed to do was to devise a new system and a new way of doing this and it was the process of trying to divide up and approach the site and get it into a geographical information system that allowed us to rethink and radically rethink the ways in which we processed uh, this information. Now, I don't, I'm not going to go back and tell you how we used to do it to show the difference, but instead what I'll try to do is show you what we did do, and you'll have to take my word for it that it, it turns out it was a, a new way of doing things. So as you approach a site that looks like this, what on earth do you do? How do you make sense of walls that you don't know where they start and where they end? Well, what we said is that what you do is you put it all into a GIS and you just start dividing it up. You take a space and you say, this segment here, from its intersection with this wall to its intersection with this wall, is a unit, an arbitrary unit of masonry, which we called a wall segment. And we divided the site up so that every section of the site had one wall segment that was indivisible by length. If we zoom in, we can see this a little bit better, just to get a better sense of what we're talking about here. And what we then, re- what we then were able to do is to say, this plan, which we called the atomized landscape, right? Every piece of the architecture had been broken down to its kind of atomic unit. It's, it's, although it's not technically indivisible, it was a good enough plan of action for this. And it meant that wherever one wall met another wall, it was where we would go to look to say, do you belong with you or are you different? How do we make friends amongst this architecture? Well, we had, and you're gonna see wall segment. We're gonna, I'm gonna put down here at the bottom some of the, uh, the pathways that the information and the structure is gonna take. So what we do is we begin to look at the walls for their relationships, stratigraphic relationships. In a second, I'm gonna show you a, a plan that, that, that makes something of that, so, or an image that makes something of that. So in one sense, this is us reducing the landscape to nothing more, in doing this all in GIS, to nothing more than some abstract notions of where things are. And it allowed us to say, we don't have to believe that anything is anywhere, we have to go and test it. So test it we did with the following kinds of evidence. We would go and we'd look at the walls and we had means of approach, or means, uh, different means of approaching this architecture. We had what we're gonna call stratigraphic relationships or information and relationships amongst the walls that relate to the physical properties, the physical organization of, the, uh, of these pieces of masonry. So here you have a wall that on one hand is built here And I wonder if you can see the seam that runs down coming along here and this other wall that's actually built up against it and then overlies it. So here you have a stratigraphic relationship of overlying, right? It's pretty simple. This wall had to already be there in order for that wall to butt up against it and build over it. Pretty simple, because now we can say first, we can say second, right? You can also see that we have a relationship here where this wall coming in is abutting this wall. This one has to be first, this one is second, and this one now is our third. So suddenly now, we have the opportunity to, by breaking down the site into these individual wall segments, to begin to look at the different ways in which the walls interact with one another. But look at all the other boxes I have here. So I've color-coded them with blue for physical or stratigraphic relationships, and a kind of nice peach color, I think. Uh, it It was more yellow, or more orange in the original, but that's okay, peach is a nice color. What these all have in common 
is that they rely on us to look at the materials, their arrangement, and the bonding, the, the mechanisms that bond them together. So we have different types of materials, right? And so we can actually see how there's much more tile in this wall and much less in this wall. We can see how the organization of the stones is different between these two walls as well. And then we can talk about the difference in the bonding agent, the mortar that's actually stuck in the wall. Each of those is a, is a observation that allows us to say this is more similar, this is more different, right? These are typological concerns where we can say this is one type of wall, not a lot of, lots of rocks, not a lot of tile, really hard mortar. This is a type of wall with not as hard of mortar, lots of tile, different organization. These rely, these other three, they rely not on a overlapping or physical set of logics, but on a form of reasoning that relies on analogy. This is like this, this is not like that. So this is stratigraphic relationships, and these I will call analogical relationships, or relying on analogy. So what we did then is busily, we went around the site, and we looked at every one of these intersections, and in our database linked to our GIS, we said, this bonds. So you can see right here, the little X's, this bonds, or this abuts. And so you can see little circles here, which got a little crazy with the white things that went away from it, but that was kind of fun. And you get a chance to see where this segment and this segment bond to each other. They grab each other, they're the same construction, but this one isn't. But it does bond to this, and it does bond to this. And now we can begin to add up the stratigraphically related elements. So we did this for the whole site, and once we had done this and told the GIS what we thought was at each one, it allowed us to not only visualize that relationship, but actually to make it bond and to make it clear in our, um, in our hierarchy. Now, when I use the word hierarchy, it's because I, I want to ease you into a terrible, terrible phrase, which is the hierarchy of abstractions. We have yet to come up with a better phrase for what this kind of workflow, what this kind of structure of the way that we do our thinking with objects and then forms of reasoning. Um, so if you have a better idea, I'd love to hear it. But right now we're stuck with hierarchy of abstractions. What we have is our atomic level. And so I'm going to walk through this a little bit more. What we have is our atomic level of wall segments that we use the stratigraphic information to first add up to a, a larger unit, which I was showing you before, what we call a wall construction unit. A wall construction unit is the largest unit that was constructed in the past at the same time. These are pieces of buildings. Now what we will do next is we say, well, these things do abut other wall construction units, but in order to add them to each other, we need to use those similarities and differences of style and technique. So this is where we apply our analogical relationships, and by removing them from back here, we allow us to only use this form of information once we've sorted it against something else we feel a little bit more confident about, right? So that allows us to move into what we call the subphase, and then finally, at this point, where we start looking at, because this was an excavation we didn't dig, once we start looking at all the uh, information from artifacts, we're able to come down into an individual phase. So here is our, our organization, our workflow. This is the units of materials that we end up aggregating over time inside of our GIS, and these are the forms of reasoning or the types of evidence that we're using to get through that. So quickly, now that you've seen this, I'll begin to show you what adding this up starts to look like. And you saw, just to go back, we're going to use blue, and then we're going to use different colors, green once we get to our wall construction units, and you can see how we're beginning to collapse the complexity of a site we couldn't understand at all at first, right? We had a site of 192, 197 wall segments. We get down into about 90 wall construction units. From there, we move on to the level of the subphase, and we have 17 subphases. So we're now able to begin to see things with this blue building that looks a little bit like something like a building, right? Unfortunately, the past comes to us in pieces, and we have to assemble it, and we, you know, you don't get the box of the puzzle with the actual thing on it, right? You don't get to work from that. You just, you barely even get an end piece, right? You just get stuff in the middle. Um, and so there's stuff that still isn't quite 
making sense in here, but that's okay because by the time we get to add everything up, we were able to reduce the site to just nine phases, six of which happened before the site was destroyed, and the last two happened after the site was destroyed and um, re-occupied. But if we look, our earliest buildings here are in black. You can see them sticking out here, here, and the remnants of them here, and one over here. Then a building in blue appears, and you can see it here, and its friend up over here. That building then, later, gets another building, or at least a set of walls, that begins to connect them and, and deal with the space between them. In subsequent phases, we get an articulation of the space in between, and you can see how now those spaces fill in with rooms, and we begin to see a suite of rooms as if they actually had something to do with a building that we might recognize. And then finally, we see over here this red space, um, a final building that, um, that comes in to take over uh, this area um, with this drain that comes along here as well, and we actually think this is outdoor space, finally. Now, why this is interesting, is it'll, or why this I think is important to tell you about, is this is, a, this is not so much a success, I do feel a success for our historical work, but what's interesting about it is how it was the technology of GIS that gave us a structure to follow, and it began something that, uh, that uh, you know, those of us, in, I'm gonna visit Lee's class tomorrow, those of us who deal with the ancient world and deal with lots of technologies, we begun to talk about the ways in which a technological tool begins to structure the way that you work. And so we have both our on-site workflow and we have what we might call the data flow, the ways in which the, inter, the, the intermediating technologies force us to work or I think in this case, encourage us to work in a new and interesting way. All right. I also like to um, show off pretty slides as we transition from one place to another. This is an Isthmia, but it's as, we leave, um, uh, as, as we leave Greece, uh, we have here the, the, uh, the temple at, at Corinth, where there's a new project that I'm beginning uh, at ancient Corinth uh, that's going to use these, some of these same techniques. So pretty picture as a palate cleanser. And again, Tharos, in case you didn't know how to spell it. Um, Tharos is an ancient city on the western coast of the island of Sardinia. Here you see it. Um, it exists on this little peninsula, um, sticking down into the Bay of Oristano, and in this space here is where the site is. Now, let me just zoom down to show you how drones are impacting our work. Our dig has a trailer. This is a project called the Tharos Archaeological Research Project. It's directed by uh, our good friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Ellis at the University of Cincinnati uh, and run through Cincinnati. Um, Lee and I are kind of heads uh, of different areas of this dig, and we're really excited about this po the potential of this site. Coming from Pompeii, coming from Morgantina, coming from Isthmia, uh, coming from a number of different places, we have an opportunity to bring all that expertise to a new place. And the thing I want to talk to you about now is the impact that drones have had before we even start. It's really impressive and really interesting. So, um, for example, last summer we had a drone. We were only allowed to fly it when tourists weren't there. So we flew it just before sundown and just before kind of sun up, before the tourists arrived which is great. It meant that we had kind of low shadows uh, on the site. It meant that our, our images looked really quite good. Um, and it also meant, because we uh, were new to this, that we had to kind of figure it all out as we went along. Our products are not as good as they're going to be this summer, but they were still outstanding. And they solved a problem for us. That they allowed us to begin to solve a problem that was unsolvable otherwise, which is we know where Tharos is, and we know some of the things in it, 
But as a team, as we walked around and tried to understand the site, we, we would look at a place and say, well, you know that one building that's like at the end of the street? It's down, it's where the intersection is. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's the, the yeah, that's the thing. That's not a way to talk to each other, right? We need ways to name things. We need a system of nomenclature. We need to be able to disambiguate and be clear about things. But Tharos doesn't have that kind of infrastructure. So getting this drone data was really important because what it allowed us to do is to mosaic that information, all this imagery together, and to put it into a GIS and begin to draw over it. Because we didn't have even a basic division, one of the first things that we did is just broke the site up into regions. Region one, two, three, and four. Now, you'll see why we decided, divided this up as we wanted to. Originally, we went one, two, three, four, but then we realized maybe we'll find something over here, so we, we numbered it the other way. <laughs> this is really steep and probably unlikely, but nonetheless, that was a choice that we made. Because I'm interested in roads, one of the next things that we uh, put uh, in the GIS, we drew over, was the streets. And the street grid became very important because one, it's one of the ways that we began to divide up our regions. Things on one side of a major street fit over here, another side of the street fit over here. And that's also how we began to divide up the individual city blocks. Now these don't look like blocks because when I say block, you think square, you think orthogonal relationships. We don't have much of that here, do we? And that's a real problem for us because if we want to be able to divide the city up, streets are a really convenient way to do that. So we have found that we can divide it up into some of the alleys and some of the streets. And so these are the first named city blocks and they're named for their region and the block. So here's region one, block number one and two and three, region three, number 12. You can see how this system is working out. Clearly, those of you who have ever looked at a map of Pompeii will recognize a similar kind of what they call Fiorellian system. But look at how much of the site isn't excavated and isn't exposed. And so if we want to go and dig places that haven't already been dug, if we don't want to just dig where other people have investigated, we need to divide up the site into the unexcavated portions. So we took some arbitrary lines in order to begin to break some, some uh, relatively uh, similar sizes of spaces, even though they're completely different, and we created what we call zones. What I want to tell you is that it took probably about two days for me to do most of this by myself. It, I mean, I did, it, I did the drawing by myself, I did it in consultation with the team, so it was a team effort to create this, but because we had this drone we had the imagery we needed to be able to see where to draw the lines. Because we had GIS, we had the opportunity to put lines onto a map in real space, and over a short amount of time, we were able to create an infrastructure and a nomenclature for a site that allowed us to talk meaningfully about it when we couldn't before. There's other things that we mapped. These are the areas of political control of who has an excavation permit or a research permit in different parts of the city. And we didn't have this before. This is really an important thing to have because one needs to be respectful that people have put in time and effort to a research agenda and that if you just show up and start walking over their permits, they might not appreciate that. So this is a, as much as this is a political map, this is a map of respect as well. And not that we learned it the hard way, but we certainly came to realize and appreciate how valuable an image this could be as we began to no negotiate not just an ancient city, but a modern city that has an, uh, an overlay of academic political culture. Now, when I say drones are cool, this is the kind of stuff that we want, we want to get into, right? We want to get into the cool imagery, and this is really some of the power of it, is that you can look at a site and get over the top of it and begin to really see things because these drone images are on their own spectacular, but when you mosaic them together, some of our imagery comes down to just over one and a third centimeters per pixel. That's really, really amazing. Some of these two and a half gigabyte photos are hard to load, but when you get down to the detail, you can see individual nails in the boards that cover the drains in the city. So when we begin to draw things, 
we can decide if we want to draw just the road as I drew, or we want to draw every single block in the road. This is a level of detail that is astounding. When we pull out for a second, you can see that we have already drawn our roads, but I have a student who's now doing this work, and she has put in all of the visible drainage in the site. So now we're already beginning to get some of the ancient city's architecture, or sorry, its infrastructure. The same student and a partner are beginning to draw the architecture and the walls. They've done this in the equivalent of about a few weeks of work, right? That's including their training to learn how to do this. So whereas it took 40 years to get Ismia up to a position in which people could draw it, draw it and use it architecturally as a scaffold for information, before we even arrive at Tharos, the images from the drone allow us to prepare the site for an analysis like what we see, what I just showed you at Ismia, and it allows us to have a full and, and, and complete, a very full and very complete digital scaffold for the site for attaching the information that we begin to find, an information uh, like at Pompeii. This is uh, the view of the bay, and I think uh, this quick rendition of drones at, at Tharos shows that our, uh, although this is the sun setting, I think it's actually rising, and it's a, it's a lovely uh, site to work at. You probably know how to spell Pompeii, but we're going to go there now. Uh, as Hamsa told you at the beginning of, the, uh, of uh, uh, the talk with the introduction, this is a site I've worked on quite a bit. Uh, I've spent uh, more than two and a half calendar years on site. Uh, and in those many hundreds of days, there's not one of them I haven't found something entirely new. So for those of you who don't know uh, where Pompeii is, and that is okay if you don't, it is a place here in southern uh, Italy, down south of Naples. Uh, and this is the site um, from the digital view that we produced in the um, uh, Pompeii bibliography and mapping project. What you see here is 640,000 square meters of incredible detail spread out over the extent of an entire city. That's what makes Pompeii so interesting and so unique. It's not that there is an, a novel and precise moment at the site. It's that there are tens of thousands of them across the site, and it continually reveals new things. Now, from the point of view of technology and the talk that I'm trying to present to you today, it also provides an opportunity to take the 250 years of scholarship, the 23,000 and now probably about 25,000 pieces of writing about the ancient city, and find a way to put them and attach them to the places where they're most meaningful. So here in the map, one of the things we've done is we've actually begun to create a, a map at the level of the individual building where you can click on a building, it can tell you about its name, where it's located, its size, some of its basic bibliography, and you can click uh, to get through to the bibliography itself uh, through an online Zotero page. Uh, this is a, a search for August Mao, somebody I'm thinking about a lot right now, and you can begin to get at this bibliography. Some of it we've begun to enrich with links out to places like Hati Trust and Internet Archive uh, and, and JSTOR if you have an institutional link to that. So you can go from having an interest about the amphitheater in Pompeii to reading about it. And we've also linked uh, to a really remarkable site called Pompeii and Pictures. So you can go from having an interest in the, uh, a the amphitheater at Pompeii to going and looking at what will end up being several hundred images of the amphitheater. So your exploration of the ancient city of Pompeii because of this map can be greatly, I think, enhanced. But that isn't really the full scale of Pompeii. I've kind of lost some of the edges here. Pompeii, when I zoom into the map and we get a little bit closer, we can start to see the detail of the site emerge, right? Can we get to see the scale and the complexity of the place? And let me just give you some of the complexity numerically. The city is divided up into nine regions. It's broken down currently into about 111 known insulae, so city blocks that are either fully or partially excavated. There are probably uh, 1,100 buildings. It's hard to really define what we mean by a building. Sometimes you can see an individual house that is quite clear that we mean that's a building, but sometimes we have 
a little shop right on the corner that's embedded in another building, but it's kind of its own space, so how do we treat it? So, you know, there aren't really 1,100 houses, but there are 1,100 spaces, buildings uh, in the city that would have been individual, uh, that would have been known to individuals. When we zoom down, there's about 10,000 rooms in the city. There's 86,000 or more wall faces, individual segments of walls that face into this room and face into that room. And from Pompeian pictures and from some catalogs, there are over 140,000 images that are currently kind of accessible, easy, relatively easily accessible. And that's not even counting what happens when you just put in Google, something in Google, right? So as a, as a resource of physical space and digital representation, there's lots out there. So the next thing that we're beginning to do is this project called the Pompeii Linked Open Data Project with one particular embodiment right now is called the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project. And we're beginning to zoom in and drill down on the map. So here in purple is all those individual buildings, all 1,100 of them. And when you get to this point, this is all of the 10,000 plus rooms in the city. Now, let me just pause for a second and ask you to think about something. I want you to just kind of get the scale of knowledge that we're able to achieve in this sense through an analogy. Think about where you live. Think about what you conceive of as your neighborhood. And then imagine the number of houses that you've been into in your neighborhood. Look at the panoptic, panop Look at the panopticon that we're able to achieve in this site. I haven't gone into 10%, 5% of the houses in my neighborhood, and I have a child with lots of friends. And I haven't been into probably half of the rooms of those houses. At Pompeii, I've been into hundreds of houses, and I've been into thousands of rooms. My experience and our experience of the ancient world is as a deity from above, right? We are deeply intrusive, and that is both weird and wonderful. At the level of the individual room, this is just to kind of zoom in to look at what individual rooms look like. As I mentioned before, like we, when we looked at Tharos, we divided it into regions, we divided it into blocks, we divided it, and we are trying to get to the level of an individual building. Here, this is the famous House of the Fawn. It is region six. It is insula 12, it is doorway number two, meaning building number two, and this happens to be room 27. But our ability to atomize Pompeii goes even further, because I told you there's 86,000 plus wall faces, and each of them has its own unique identifier. And that's important, because it allows us to say the artwork that's on these walls can be attached to them. What you're looking at is an image from the um, National Museum uh, of Arche National Archaeological Museum at Naples. This is an image of their model of Pompeii, created and final finalized in 1879. The wall you're looking at is about that tall. And this wall that you're looking at may, in fact, not have that painting on it anymore. This is an incredible three-dimensional document of the ancient world that now has that on there. And I use it as my conceit to tell you about this amazing thing that they did in the 19th century science, but also as my vibrant image that allows you to say, wow, look at the colors, look at the decoration. Let me add one more thing in there. Think of what's on your wall, right? We have some art, right? But we have also a lot of photos. We have a lot of colorful walls, but not a lot of imagery. Most of the wall paintings in Pompeii reflect not a real thing, like they're not photographs of something, right? They are illusions of space or illusions of material. And in most cases, what you're talking about is not a thing that a Roman represented on the wall to show you something else that also exists in the world. These are acts of imagination. And so we have 86,000 pieces of Roman imagination floating around. We have an entire world 
imagined onto these walls, and we get to deal with that at scale. That's the kind of the magic of Pompeii. It is also the challenge of the project that I'm trying to do that I've just called the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project. So this is a lovely photo. This is a lovely picture of a lovely piece of wall art. And I have here, next to it, linked open data, because this is the technology that I'm wanting to apply here. Tech, it's not really a technology in the way that GIS is a platform and a drone is a machine. It's more a set of ideals and standards. Linked open data is really not much more than taking information, putting it in standard formats, putting it online with a stable and unique identifier, and beginning to use that as a link to other things, putting it together. Um, those of you who know Tim Berners-Lee, this is his uh, kind of dream for the internet and the semantic web. And what this would mean is that if we can take this image and begin to really closely annotate it, we're going to use this thing called recogito. If we can really closely annotate it, we can draw a little box around a piece of the image. We can adapt this current schema and place the information that we want in here by human, add in other annotations, and begin to get not just tens of thousands of walls, but potentially hundreds of thousands of annotations. We could get a chance to look at Pompeian wall art and Pompeian and Ro ancient Roman imagination at the same atomic level that we tried to look at the just simple masonry at Isthmia. Why would we do that? What do we hope to get from it? What do I hope to get in this project? And, and it's at this point that I recognize two things. One, we're at the very, very beginning of this project. We have now put in about, what is it, April? We've now put in four and a half months onto this project. It's deeply exciting. And we're really, really, so my colleague on this is uh, Sebastian Heath. He's an associate clinical professor uh, of classics at the uh, Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU. Uh, and we are grateful for our funding from the Getty Foundation, which we just received uh, for the next three years. What could we hope to achieve is unique opportunities for scholars and the public to engage with this material. Because right now, you can't go to the Pompeii Bibliography and Mapping Project and easily go and look at one of these pieces of art, despite the amazing work that Bob and Jackie Dunn have done in Pompeii and Pictures. Now, if you're a scholar, Maybe one of the things you're interested in is little baby Hercules. And you might want to think about Hercules' representations in Roman wall art. Well, right now, we have these massive catalogs that if I stacked them in front of you right now, I couldn't jump over them, right? They're, they're, they're massive. And you can imagine what it would be like to flip through those pages to try to figure out where all the Herculeses are, because there isn't a full index. There is a catalog but the catalog doesn't have an index. One of the things we'd like to do is let people find Hercules wherever he is. And so if you find Hercules, you might find him in this painting. And there is a baby strangling some snakes because that's what Hercules does. <laughs> and here he is in another garden, perhaps representing the garden uh, where he is in his 11th labor, uh, finding and recovering the apples of the Hesperides. Uh, maybe this is the golden apple up here. But then you realize, you know what? I don't actually like Hercules. He's a jerk. He's kind of like a madman. I'm not into that, right? It's 2019. We don't need that guy. I think fruit is cool. So you could suddenly shift to show me all of the fruit in Pompeii. And it sounds frivolous, but that's the point. The point is to allow a set of scholars to find their interest and not have to spend hundreds of hours developing an idea of whether or not it's a, pardon the pun, a fruitful course of action. I didn't plan that, and I'm not, <laughs> I, I usually plan my puns, and I'm not proud of it, uh, uh, that one. Uh, but we'd want people to, to we'd want to take away the problem of investment of time. We'd want people to just explore this material and come up with an interesting idea, a novel set of relationships in which the burden of simple research is lifted and the human imagination into this landscape of ancient imagination could be uh, uh, made equal. Last thing, what is the biggest thing that might come from this? 
I do, I'm not going to dive into a, a rendition of how Roman wall painting is, is broken down, but there are four styles. They're broken down into the illusion of materials, the illusion of space, the collapse of space, and the reemergence of space, right? So what you see here is this guy, August Mao, who I, meant bef I mentioned before, describing these artworks through a particular framework. He said, in the earliest days, they hadn't yet started making the illusion of depth. After they found out they like to pretend that they have fancy stuff, then they thought, if fancy stuff is cool, let's put a column in front of it. And then they put more columns, and then columns receded into the distance, and then imaginative, huge landscapes opened up until people thought, that's not a good idea, let's not do that anymore. And you got the collapse of the wall, but not really the reduction of, of complexity. You still have these complex things. And then finally, they said, well, you can have some of that, right? So you get this opening back up. This is an argument about how to understand these tens of thousands of artworks that was put together in 1879 and published again kind of more thoroughly in 1882. This is a really old model, right? It is a deeply durable heuristic. But is it the only way to slice through this massive set of data? Is this really the best way to understand all of this artwork from the ancient world? I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe this is in fact how the ancients saw it. But if we cut up, if we atomize our materials and we lift the burden of indi individuals from having to go through all this, maybe someone will find the courage and the ambition to challenge Mao because it isn't going to be a lifetime work anymore. The last slide I want to leave you with is kind of ugly because uh, it's one of these. <laughs> but I threw it in here at the end and I kind of changed things this afternoon. I threw it in here at the end because we're talking about technology and how technology is impacting archaeology. And I realized that in order to do this project I'm doing now, I need to deal with imagery. And to do it at scale, I need to deal with computer vision and artificial intelligence. And so I'm working with computer scientists and data scientists to do that. And data scientists and uh, computer scientists are helping me deal with the text catalogs, text and images. And so text extraction and natural language processing, these are things I have to engage with. These are technologies that are going to be crucial to our work. Human beings creating vocabularies and ontologies that are going to help us organize and structure the way in which we link and describe this information. They need to go in here. GIS is still important. It's going to go into Rukhogito. We're going to use that as training data to come back over here. When we talk about what technologies are impacting archaeology today, it's almost everything you can imagine. And it's because today, technology is becoming easy for people who are not me, or sorry, sorry people who are not computer scientists like me, to begin to engage with it to begin to recognize its potential and to throw it like spaghetti against the proverbial wall to see what will come out, what can we get with it. So in the end, I think our, our end point is that how is technology impacting archaeology in the same way it's impacting everything. And archaeologists see this as a new toolbox, just like we saw, just like we stole every other tool that we ever had, right? A trowel is actually from masons, right? We didn't invent a shovel. When you look at our theories, they come from geology and anthropology. Very few things do we ever come up with on our own, and now we're looking into the computer science and data science revolution to revolutionize our work once again, and I very much hope uh, that that will be a profitable and exciting thing to see forth in the future, and I'm glad to be a part of it. So, uh, thank you. We now have time for questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question. One of us will bring the mic to you. Uh, if you're able to, please stand up while you ask your question, and priority will be going to students. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering if um, how you see the reconstruction of ancient space in digital space, say like in virtual reality, impacting the way, ways in which archaeologists are able to 
tell the story of the past? Yeah, thank you, that's a great question. So one of the things not in, involved in the, the things I've told you is something that, that we are doing a lot with, which is making 3D models and using photogrammetrical reconstructions in order to get at a photorealistic image of what a space would look like. Um, there's a couple ways of looking at that. I, I am, I'm, I'm influenced by some, some colleagues who, if, if I look at technology and want to use it like the gas pedal, they look at technology and are worried and want to put on the brakes, okay? Uh, so I, I'll leave it, to, I will acknowledge that part and then give you some gas, okay? Um, I'm very interested in the ways in which one of the things that digital surrogates, particularly ones that are about embedding oneself in 3D space, allows you to interact with space and interact with information in ways that you might do so in the real world and in more efficient and more meaningful ways. So for example, you know, just thinking about the ways in which our brains process space, it allows us to make connections because we're, we're used to doing that, right? I mean, we can all imagine closing our eyes right now and making our way to the bathroom. Like, we might stumble a little bit, but we could probably all do that. And that's, there's a lot of visual information that we need to retain and process and use in order to just close our eyes and walk to the bathroom. And I'm very interested in seeing how we can use digital surrogates, digital 3D models, to use that potential to get people to walk into an ancient space in virtual reality and study it as if they were there, but then also use it to scaffold information inside that space so that that ability to make connections can leverage that ability that we have as well. Um, that's one of the things I'm most excited about. Is that, is that uh, an answer that you, all right, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, I was very interested in the uses that you see for digital technology, but I was wondering if you could speak at all for the potential impact on digital technology in archeology span for preserving cultural heritage in the face of threats like climate change or global conflict and how you potentially see this playing a role in, in those areas. It's a really good question. Um, it's, it's not something that I've invested a lot of thought in. Uh, and, and time in, and you know, in certain senses, that's a moral failure, and I'm I'm not happy, but willing to admit that. Um, I can see a couple of areas um, in which it advances digital preservation, so or, or, or preservation of sites. One is the model that sometimes somewhat short-sighted people um, see a digital model as a as a form of uh, competition with an ancient site. And I think we've all come to realize that what the simulacrum does is drive attention to the real thing. That as, as interesting and valuable as it is, just like we've seen people talking about Notre Dame, it isn't the same if you're not having that authentic moment. And so I do believe that showing people interesting aspects of the past from a digital reconstruction or a digital element can help say, now go see the real thing, right? go to these places. And it is, in almost all senses, it is the economy of tourism that drives the preservation of so many of these places. Um, that's, that's perhaps the, the kind of the, the, the biggest thing um, that I can think of off the top of my head. And I had another, and it has escaped me. Um, I will blurt it out later if I remember. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the second one. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, so digital tools and everything, they help a lot with just making archeology span and academics much more accessible, but right now it seems like it's very much within a scholarly, um, mm -hmm. I guess, environment and sphere. How do you see the tools and technologies that you're using to create these 3D images and explorative online sites um, impact the way education will be structured for ancient civilizations late in the future? Good question. So there's a couple things. So let's start by explaining why things like the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project and the Bibliography and Mapping Project are aimed at scholars first. It's because that's how I am rewarded and advanced in my career, right? It's because I'm embedded in an economy that requires me to get grants and to create to create products 
that look like and feel like and smell like the kinds of things that would be equivalent to a book or an article or a journal. I meant to advance science humanistic inquiry with my work. But it is not at all, therefore, antithetical to making it part of public work. Um, I just looked at a single data set in preparation for this talk that's online now, and it has had 47,000 views. I guarantee only a small, small fraction of that is actually from academics, right? So for the Pompeii Bibliography Mapping Project, it is simply just putting it online. It's not, it's not a naive field of dreams, if you build it, they'll come. It is simply a put it out there and let the world have it, right? So make it accessible in that way. As far as how we then teach with it, um, I think, and, and the way that I've tried to teach with it, is to use it as a mechanism, because I know it very well, use it as a way to allow students to get something of what I've been privileged enough to experience in my career, which is what it's like to be there. You can't really do that, right? You can't actually make that, that change, but what I can do is show people what real research looks like, and I can embed that in the map. I can, um, uh, I can show people what it, a place that they would never probably try to go to on their own, and I can use that in a classroom setting. I've, um, one example I'll give that's it's not something you can just do with the map, but uh, a few years ago, I went to Pompeii with this thing called a structure sensor, and what it is is a thing you put onto an iPad, and it emits an infrared light, uh, infrared beam, uh, and you just kind of like paint over something like this, and it captures both a, um, uh, a structure of it and also the, the imagery of it as well. So you get a 3D model in a, in, on it as well. And I had seen these wearing patterns from carts on the side of the street, and I was like, oh, I think I know what those are. I want to capture them and then study them and measure them. And then I knew I was teaching Pompeii in the fall, so I just left that bit of research untouched. And I reserved it to have a very first kind of opening of that can with the students and said, you're going to deal with, you're going to deal with real research that no one has done anything with. This is going to be the first time, whatever we find, it'll be the first time that anyone has ever found that. And so for me, part of that is saying, how do I take a digital object and make it into something authentic that a student can take some ownership and control and good feelings about? And when it gets published, there's going to be like 12 authors <laughs> on that paper because they were the ones who helped me put that all together and came to some of the really great uh, ideas about it. It's not, it's not earth shattering, but it's important to me. Um, so at the end of your talk, you mentioned things like um, natural language programming and computer vision and AI, things like that. What would you say are the pitfalls of using tools like those which have no intrinsic understanding of culture to do research on a culture that we ourselves don't fully understand? Yeah, so what does the goldfish know of the water in which it swims, right? I mean, uh, it's it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to use a tool when you don't know the outcome of it. Um, there's kind of two different questions embedded in your question. One is, can we trust the tool to get us an answer? And the first part of that question is, um, the fir the first, my first response to that is, no, of course not. It's just a machine. So one of the things I'm hoping to get is not run computer vision on this material and then tell me where every Hercules is, because that's an act of identification. That's an iconographic uh, interpretation that really needs a human to do. What I want this machine to do is to simply draw a box around something that it thinks is a person or a figure or a goat or a column, because that's an act that a student or someone else needs to do. They actually have to physically make that box. And all I want is the number of seconds back that would take to do that simple thing. Um, I think we have a value when we then add the human corrected data as training data back into our machine and then help it do better in the future. But n I, I never think, uh, well, it's, no, it's not true. I don't ever want the machine to come up with the answer because that is the joy that I get out of being a scholar, right? That 
it's, it's, the, uh, it's the, the sense of discovery and fascination about the past that the machine would take away from me. So I don't want to be, I don't want to take me or anyone else out of the sequence, not just because I have some highfalutin notion that human beings are always necessary. I actually don't think that. I have a more selfish take, which is that I really am interested in these things and I want to be a part of that contribution because it feels good. Uh, the second part of your question, I think, is do we, kn we don't fully understand the past. And I would say that if, uh, I, I guess I would kind of reflect on fatalism in general, because the whole reason we dig a trench is because we don't know what's there. Uh, and so not knowing is, is what drives us forward. And then the tools that we use, they need to be controlled and understood. And at very least, they shouldn't take our joy away. And at very best, they should get something close to the right answer for us. Uh, my question is, is concerning um, uh, documents that you might might have found or not found in your uh, digging process. Because a while back there in the program 60 Minutes, they mentioned that they are able to scan uh, mm. carbonized uh, papyrus uh, books uh, from these Roman ruins. And I was wondering if, if during your digging you you had come up across any of these uh, documents and what, what have they done about it? It's a great question. <coughs> Excuse me. Sadly, no. Um, I, uh, because I work at Pompeii rather than Herculaneum, those two sites had very different experience of the eruption. And the uh, sudden and devastating effect of pyroclastic flows that hit Herculaneum uh, preserved that site differently, including organic matter that was carbonized. And these scrolls that you're talking about come from a place called the Villa of the Papyri, named after the scrolls. Um, that have been carbonized. These have been, people have been trying to, and as you know from watching 60 Minutes, these have been attempted to be understood for a long time. We now have this MRI and other scanning technologies allow us to kind of digitally unroll them. Um, sadly, no, I've never encountered them. Uh, and as someone who doesn't have the training to read what's in them, and, and so that I don't have that methodological ability, and as someone who hasn't been trained in the culture and the literary culture that they would have been expressing, it isn't something that I've, uh, I've been involved in. But it does raise a number of really interesting archeological questions, which is we have some of those and we think there are more of them. What should we do about that? Should we go get them? Or, you know, they were pretty good for about 2000 years where they were. Should we continue to trust that preservation model into the future? It's a, it is a moral hazard in either direction, to either go after them and believe we're better to save them, like the Elgin marbles, <laughs> or do we trust in the soil even as we produce acid rain and change the soil chemistry and let them stay there? Um, I don't have an opinion on those things. And I'll say one other thing, to, to kind of come to your question one more in one other way. Um, that would be an incredibly remarkable find, right? It's the opportunity to add to classical literature in volumes that haven't been added in quite a long time. Um, a colleague, uh, 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 Stephen Ellis, who I mentioned here earlier, my colleague at, and, and, and Lee's colleague at Tharos, has a colleague at his university, at the University of Cincinnati, who you may have found, heard about his Griffin Warrior uh, discovery. This is uh, Sherry Strocker uh, and her husband, Jack Davis, uh, discovered this a couple years ago in Greece. And they came and presented it. I'm not sure I ever want to discover something that famous. The amount of effort and time that goes into the true discovery and documentation of that took over Sherry and Jack's life. For six months, they had to raise a half a million dollars immediately to do it. I'm not sure I want to find something like that. <laughs> I'd rather go along with my scrapes on the roads and my uh, digital representations. The stakes are lower. Maybe I'm a coward, I guess. <laughs> Uh, this, this gentleman and others up here have had questions, and that gentleman as well. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that uh, reflects my own biases, which is, as a psychologist, um, you have, as I understand it, you are primarily dealing with spaces and constructed spaces, if that's fair to say, and artifacts, but uh, those spaces were constructed for some purpose, and uh, the other side that, that I, what I see missing 
if I may say so, is uh, the behavior. Mm -hmm. The behavior. What happened in those spaces? Uh, I come from a discipline that talks about behavior settings. And uh, what I've heard is mostly about the spaces yeah. in which people would presumably have done things. And I don't see, I'd like to see more of the consideration of what happens there. Why do we care about these spaces? Don't, uh, do we not care more about what people did besides construct them? Great question. Um, my answer is going to be a disappointing one, which is that we have recently been, by a very brilliant scholar, disabused of the tautologies that allowed us to think we understood what happened in these places. Um, for a long time, we took ancient literature, and particularly one voice, Vitruvius, who described kind of an idealistic way to create a Roman house or other types of Roman buildings. And he gave us labels, and so in some cases, sequences of rooms. And we then took that to Pompeii, and we took his idealistic model, and we started using that to put labels on rooms, because then we could use that label to affix it to things that we read about in ancient sources to get at those behaviors. Now, we've recently had someone who's shown us that, you know what, this is actually a good bit of circular reasoning. We don't actually know what happened in those rooms. We don't know that that's the label. And so we're kind of stuck with what we believe. Now, we could approach this from a more, uh, from one side and see where we get, and then approach it from other sides and see where we get. One of the things I would like to be able to do is to take these rooms see how they're painted and see if there's something meaningful at scale from these things as well. I'm, oh, I am not confident at all that we'll get something out of that. I think what we'll end up doing is looking back to say, well, we expect this to be a dining room. This is the kind of imagery that shows people dining. It's the kind of imagery that would produce conversation and therefore I think it's probably a dining room. And I don't think that's necessarily wrong but I'm not sure that it, uh, it gets us any, f any further than where we are right now with our current assumptions. Um, the other thing that's a problem is that Vitruvius has given us this model, and we've taken it to Pompeii, and if you go and you look at the map, there are more than 400 houses in Pompeii, and not a single one of them matches what Vitruvius told us. So the lived experience of the most specific, the lived experience of an ancient city has vanishingly little to do with what our most verbose source on what those rooms are supposed to be tells us that that is, is, so we just we have a, little, a lot of trouble matching those things um, you know the definition of archaeology is is describing human behavior from material remains because we rarely can get at intent and I'm sorry to disappoint you that we rarely even get to fully what we mean by behavior sometimes as well. Boy, I'm, I'm really a bummer for you guys. And <laughs> Hi, my name is Blake Shermie. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, do you think that technological proficiency is something that will be necessary for uh, classical scholarship going forward as a skill in general? The way that you phrase the question, will it be necessary? No. Um, it won't be necessary for a couple of reasons. One, it won't be necessary because, for, for the best of reasons, it won't be necessary because many of the technologies that, that, are, uh, that are being relied upon right now, I believe that in a few years will be made much more um, uh, uh, human, made much more easy for average people to use. And so they'll be able to begin to use these things. So, you know, text processing or topic modeling, you can now go on online and use Voyant tools and begin like to play around in that realm. Um, I hope and believe that there'll be platforms that allow people to do this. And so it won't be a thing that you need to be trained in. It'll be a thing that I hope that, that classical scholars will be interested in exploring and that, that those people who build the technologies will build them downward so that skill levels are, are not as necessary in that. I'll also answer it from the worst of ways, which is that classics is a terribly slow to change discipline. And you know, I've been complaining about this to, to colleagues, but you know, we, we require, when you look at a classics major, we require in a facility in both Greek and Latin, in the if you're doing languages, 
where you need to take more classes than almost any other major in your major, right? And you take two years, in many majors you take two and two and a half years of your major courses and you've got these gen eds. In many, uh, in many classics departments, you need to take one class every single semester and sometimes in both languages your entire career. So one of the reasons I don't, I'm not sanguine about it changing is because we valorize that level and we, we institute such heavy coursework burdens that it does disincentivizes people to explore in a computer science course or a data science course. Um, I do see even, I, I do see at many institutions that curiosity developing, but where it's gonna, where the rubber meets the road, where, where academics are remunerated for their service to an institution is in the classroom. And that is a hard place for academics to change. And I, I hope that they will. Uh, and I would love to see classes that say, distant reading the classics, right? Um, looking at, um, there's a, a scholar who did a thing called the Million, Roman, uh, Ro Million Latin Words uh, Project. And I'd love to see that kind of thing taught as a course that could stand uh, up with an author course and be just as valuable. Thank you, great question. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for question, but Professor Paler, we did want to give you the opportunity to share any concluding remarks. S sorry? Um, we wanted to give you the opportunity for any concluding remarks. We're out of time for questions, unfortunately. Thank you. So th just the last things I would say is, if you didn't get your question answered, I will answer your question. So I'll, I'll stick around and, and, and talk to you if, if you like, wherever, wherever we can. Uh, the last things I would say is just a thank you. I mean, it is a privilege to be able to stand up here and to, and to profess, as is my profession, about <laughs> things that I just, I'm so lucky to get to care about. And that I'm lucky, unlike so many other s disciplines, that you all care. I don't have to fight you to care. You're here, and that's a, that's a real privilege, so thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Egg Paler.